Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, Nigeria is saddened by the sale of looted masterpieces here in Paris. Auction House Christie's refused to stop the sale of two sacred statues, saying that the works had been sold before. Also, Malawi's new president settling in, Lazarus Chakwera's inauguration on Sunday, came after a hard-fought victory. He won after a rerun of a presidential election, which had originally returned former President Peter Mutarika to power. And Cameroon's been ramping up efforts to rein in drug abuse in the country. Government-sponsored prevention centres have been working alongside NGOs to offer support to former addicts. But first, Nigeria said that it is saddened by the sale of two sacred statues in Paris by Christie's auction house on Monday. The Nigerian National Commission for Museums and Monuments had tried to stop the sale of the figures, which they say were stolen during the country's civil war in the late 1960s. A pair of Igbo statues went under the hammer for 212, 500,000 euros. Meanwhile, a Urhoba statue, estimated at around 900,000 euros, failed to sell. Christie's refused to stop the auction, saying that the masterpieces had been sold before. Earlier, I spoke to Professor Chika Ukeku Ugulu, a professor of African art history at Princeton University, and asked him what sales like these say. Christie's is basically telling the whole world that it's fair game to sell and buy looted objects from war zones. I think it sends a terrible message and they should just be ashamed of themselves. Now, French President Emmanuel Macron had in the past said that um, African works of art like this should be returned to their countries of origin. Do you think that there is a genuine will to do so from European collectors and museums who may have works like this in their possession? Well, as they say in Nigeria and elsewhere, I guess I'll say uh, to Macron, show me the money. Uh, he did make the famous announcement uh, that's now a couple of years, and we're still waiting. I think it's quite ridiculous that in spite of the announcement, uh, of course, not much has happened since then, that Christie's Paris would be uh, the auction house to auction off these looted objects when the debate and discussion now is the matter of restitution. I think it's um, we're waiting on not just the, the French government, but the African government who should, in fact, take him up on his word and press for the return of uh, these objects that we know when and how they were taken out of the continent. And we know that they were illegally exported um, in many instances, especially, for instance, with the case uh, of the Igbo objects that were sold today by Christie's. So tell us a bit more about what the significance behind these specific objects uh, is or was. Well, uh, Alusi figures such as the two that were sold today would have been installed in shrines, in communal shrines. They represent uh, Igbo spiritual forces and deities. Uh, and uh, if you notice that their hands are facing up uh, because they receive uh, sacrifices and, and so forth um, while installed in these shrines as representative of uh, deities and spiritual forces. Uh, to have them taken away and, in fact, displayed naked. Um, as everyone knows, these objects in the original site would have been uh, clothed. They would have had uh, cloths around their uh, waists. But in the museums and in many of these auction houses, they are presented naked, which is a total disrespect of the, the, the deities and the forces that they represent. Now, art as you've outlined those, it's clearly very valued and very precious. But when particularly at a time like this, we see so many fronts upon which um, efforts to redress the ills of colonialism are being fought, why is the return of artwork um, proving to be quite so emotive? Well, it's really about redressing the, uh, the injustices uh, and, of course, uh, crimes uh, of the past, especially during the colonial period, 
but also after in the case of the Biafran, uh, in the case of the Nigerian objects. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, looting that went on during the colonial period. And for the longest time, the institutions uh, that have supported these um, histories didn't want to address them. But I think in the age that we're in of the Black Lives Matter, when we are seeing monuments to racists and slave owners fall, I think it's about time that we also begin to ask about some of the histories of colonialism, especially as they impacted African cultural and artistic heritage. We can no longer be silent about the, these terrible and odious histories. Well, in other news, the growing international attention on racist violence that followed the killing of George Floyd in the U.S. has seen the Senegalese island of Gore rename a square in solidarity with protests. The mayor of the former slave trading center has said that the Place de l'Europe, or Europe Place, will be renamed the Place de la Liberté de la Dignité Humaine, or Liberty and Human Dignity Square. The date for the renaming hasn't yet been set, but authorities say that the ceremony will be paying tribute to Floyd, who was killed by a policeman in Minneapolis in May. Now, Malawi's new president was sworn in over the weekend. Lazarus Chakwera's inauguration was an unprecedented event in sub-Saharan Africa as he took office after winning a rerun of a presidential election which had originally returned his predecessor to power. What just happened in Malawi is unprecedented in sub-Saharan Africa. A rerun of a presidential election won by the opposition leader. Lazarus Chakwera's victory has been seen as a sign of hope by opposition parties across the continent, where quite often the same president has remained in power for decades. The opposition in Kenya and Tanzania welcomed his win. He obtained 58 percent of the vote. Chakwera is a former evangelical preacher. He was sworn in on Sunday. The time has come for us to go beyond dreaming. We all must wake up because this is a time to arise from slumber and to make our dream come true. On Monday, Chakwera named a partial cabinet, including a former insurance executive as finance minister and his lawyer as justice minister. But analysts say he has his work cut out for him because outgoing President Peter Mutarika won the support of about 40 percent of the population. I think they need to appreciate that um, we are having a country that is divided. Um, in as much as they have achieved 58% uh, of, of the total voters, but there's still another segment of the society that does not want them to come into power. So what will be critical is now to uh, start a unifying project uh, across the country. This was the second time a sub-Saharan court had ordered a rerun. The first time was in Kenya in 2017. But in Kenya, the incumbent Uhuru Kenyatta had won both the initial poll and the rerun. Well, Cameroon's been ramping up efforts to rein in drug abuse in the country. Government-sponsored prevention centres have been working alongside NGOs to offer support to former addicts. Our correspondent sent us this report. They call this place the dump. Many who come here do so to take crack. The drug's a mixture of cocaine and ammonia, and it's incredibly addictive and often completely takes over the lives of users. The number of Cameroonian crack addicts is rising. The drugs are often brought in from neighboring Nigeria. This dealer is known as Lukaid. Business is booming, and he makes up to 150,000 francs, around 320 euros in profits for every delivery. His clients come from every level of society. A few kilometers away, there is another crack den. Most of the consumers who come here are deeply and destructively addicted. Fanny is 26 and has been using hard drugs for six years. Every morning, she meets up with her group of friends. They are all users and, though young, have already started cutting themselves off from society. They spend their days here getting high. Fanny says she can't function if she doesn't get a hit. Mm -hmm. 
Bell Mayong combs the streets of these poor neighborhoods in Yaoundé looking for young addicts to help get clean. He is a former addict himself who created an NGO to fight the growing popularity of drugs in the country. He and his team try to educate these young people about the risks of using crack cocaine. He thinks that raising awareness of the dangers of the drug is the most effective deterrent. Official figures show that the use of crack in Cameroon is on the rise and that 21% of the population admits to having used an illegal substance. Well, France 24's Observer's Desk has been debunking misinformation about COVID-19. One theme that keeps on cropping up over and over again are claims that Western doctors looking for a vaccine are planning to conduct potentially dangerous tests on Africans. Our Derek Thompson has more. People from Masisi chasing away the vaccine. In Masisi, in the DRC, locals chased out a European delegation bringing COVID-19 vaccine. Fake news about vaccines. We've seen a lot of posts like this since the pandemic began. Suggestions that the international community wants to test vaccines on Africans or even kill them with vaccines that have been poisoned. In this case, the people circulating the video seem to be saying that an international delegation arrived to conduct tests on the population of the town of Masisi in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. But that is not what happened. Let's take a listen. PAM, P-A-M, is the French acronym for the World Food Program, which gives out food but does not test medicines. If you do a search for Masisi PAM on Facebook, you'll find the same video posted on June 8th, but with a different caption. The WFP isn't welcome in Masisi. They didn't hire local people. So which version is true? Here's what the local administrator told us. It was indeed a delegation from the WFP that came on June 5th and 6th, he told us. Local people turned them away because they hadn't hired local young people. There was no talk of any vaccine. So yes, this video does show an international delegation being chased out of the town of Masisi on June 6th. But it had nothing to do with COVID-19 or any vaccine. It was just a dispute over hiring. Derek Thompson there, helping keeping things clear. Well, that's it, though, for Iron Africa for now. Thanks for joining us. Do so again if you can. Take care.